Every battle fought, every road and building bombed, every bullet fired, every intercepted missile, every bit of ground a tank trudges over, all of this is extremely costly. And for every person killed in action, there is a huge price to be paid, not just for their family but also for their country. And we'll show you many times in this video, working out the monetary cost of war is far from simple. It's very hard to know exactly how many rockets were fired, how much hardware was destroyed, and what it cost a nation when you lose infrastructure and young men that should have been working in your economy. But today we'll try to put a price tag on the war, not just for the past and present, but for the costs in the years to come. The ripple effects of this war will be felt for decades, especially in the poorest segments of both Russia and Ukraine. We're going to start with the cost of war for Russia and finish with some quite shocking data regarding what this war has cost and will cost Ukraine. In nine months of fighting, it's thought Russia's used 10,000 to 50,000 shells per day. And if the average cost of a Soviet-caliber artillery shell is about a thousand bucks, then we get $5.5 billion on artillery shells. This is not an exact science, but it can at least give us an idea of the cost of the war. It was estimated that Russia fired about 4,000 missiles during that time period, with each one costing in the region of $3 million. That's $12 billion in missiles. On top of that, Russia's lost about 278 combat aircraft, with those coming in at $18 million apiece on average. The country's also lost 261 helicopters, another costly expenditure if we say the average cost of each one was $10.4 million. That means Russia's aviation losses likely amounted to $8 billion over those nine months. It was estimated that during that time period, Russia lost 2,897 tanks, not to mention how much it cost to keep fixing land equipment. We can only guess how expensive the repairs were for parts and manpower, but it's been said Russia's land vehicle losses add up to about $20 billion. The average cost for one Russian soldier every day he's alive on the battlefield is about $200, according to reports. But just how many soldiers Russia has mobilized and is preparing to mobilize is unclear. Reports in January said Russia has another 500,000 conscripts ready on top of the 300,000 already mobilized. To make things simple, let's just look at the cost of keeping 300,000 Russian soldiers fighting for nine months at $200 a day. That would be $16.44 billion. But as you know, this war is 15 months old already and more soldiers will be mobilized, so just paying their wages will cost the region of $30 billion. Again, not an exact science, it's a ballpark figure. Put another way, if a guy costs 200 bucks a day and has fought for 15 months, that's 450 days times $200, which is $90,000. No one fights every day for that long, but this is just an example. As for the ones who die, reports say their families receive 7.4 million rubles, about $110,000 each. Other reports say it's less than that, but let's stick with this number to make things simple. The problem is, we don't know how many Russian soldiers have died. The numbers reported so far might not be accurate. Some reports say about 40,000 Russian soldiers have been killed in action, but it might be much higher. Other reports state lower figures. But the 40,000 number would mean Russia's paid out $4.4 billion in compensation, not to mention how much it costs to treat wounded soldiers. If we include all the casualties, that's well over 100,000 men, we might be looking at around $10 billion for deaths and casualties. We can only estimate, but people who've tried to add up all the military costs have said Russia's war is costing the government and taxpayers $10 billion a month on average. So 15 months might have cost $150 billion. Still, that number doesn't take into account what it means to lose working men from your economy, what it means in terms of mental health in Russia, trust in the government, etc. Many people thought at the start of the war that sanctions would cripple Russia. Word on the street was the Russian economy would contract by about 15%, which would have been devastating for Russia. It didn't happen though, Russia's exports remained fairly healthy, and now the experts say Russia's economy only contracted by about 2-3%. The IMF said 2% and added that there would be slight growth in the Russian economy in 2023. As you'll see later on in the show, Ukraine hasn't been so lucky. It's been hit with an economic wrecking ball. Still, it was reported that the Russian billionaire class lost a whopping $93 billion in 2022. As for the normal folks in Russia who hurt the most, at the end of the day, they're reportedly saving their money by not buying unnecessary items. Reports say they visited malls less in 2022. One economist said at some point this will cause long-term stagnation of the Russian economy. She said the living standards of Russians would eventually erode. Russia's total goods imports were down 20% from 2021 and technology imports decreased by about 30%. 
In 2022, Russia's car production was down by about 67% and other industries saw some decreases. For example, the Russian arms industry exports have slumped while Western arms industries have thrived. We'll come back to this topic at the end. Some analysts say Russia's economy has been propped up so far, but they say there will be trouble down the line for the global pariah. Still, the Russian GDP is around $2 trillion, and the IMF forecast for the next few years keeps it at just over $2 trillion. It often depends on who you ask. For 2023, OECD reports Russia's GDP to decline by 2.5%, but the World Bank says 0.2%, while the IMF expects growth of 0.7%. It has, however, had to spend a lot on fighting. Its overall military spending plan for 2022 was $346 billion, which is a fortune when you consider that for 2020 defense spending was at $61 billion. Russia has also had to find a lot more money, and unlike Ukraine, it's paying for this war from its own pockets. We should say, everywhere you look, you can see different numbers regarding the cost of Russia's war. The Special Operations Forces report recently said, Russia's war wasn't costing the country $10 billion a month, but a massive $900 million a day. However, it did admit that adding up costs can be treated with a certain amount of flexibility. This would give us a military expenditure of $27 billion a month and a $405 billion price tag for the 15 months that have passed. $900 million a day might be a ballpark figure, but from what we can see, it's probably very close to reality. Russia isn't just going to hold up its hands anytime soon and say it's too broke to carry on. However, the country has been considerably weakened. Its military especially has been immensely weakened, which is good news for the USA and any country that considers Russia a threat. As US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin explained in 2022, we want to see Russia weaken to the degree that it can't do the kinds of things it has done in invading Ukraine. That much has happened, but at a great cost to Ukraine too. As many analysts have observed, Putin's war crime has cost his own country immeasurably. That's why even critics of US NATO policy say Putin was insane for doing what he did. But Russia still has a lot in reserve, which is why it's regarded as one of the most powerful militaries in the world. If you look at the website Global Firepower, a site that analyzes military strength, Russia comes second after the USA, with China not far behind. Russia still has about 830,000 active personnel, with another 500,000 as reserves and paramilitaries. The question is, how long can it keep watching its personnel and stocks deplete? The day we started making the show, news reports said Russia had just lost 48 artillery systems as well as two fighter jets and two helicopters in the space of two days. One of the fighter jets was a Sukhoi Su-34, priced at around $40 to $50 million. The other was a Su-35 which, if we go by how much China paid for some of them a while back, cost anywhere from $40 million to $65 million. So, Russia outguns Ukraine easily in terms of military hardware, but it also is sure losing a lot of it. These recent losses alone add up to a very expensive week for Russia. We mentioned tanks earlier. Again, it depends on what resource you look at as to how many tanks Russia has lost, but the number is usually estimated to be around 2,000. Another report stated anywhere from 1,845 to 3,511. Tanks come in all shapes and sizes, some with upgrades, some old, some new, so it's hard to give an exact cost per each tank. Still, the T-72 B-3 costs around 250,000, and Russia has lost a fair few of those. It said Russia's lost seven T-90Ms, each costing around 1.7 million. But as we're about to show you, while Ukraine is receiving weapons from other nations, the losses caused by the war on Ukraine are much more than about losing men and machines. It's Ukrainian land that's been and is being pulverized, not Russian land. Ukraine at least has some help. When you consider the aid Ukraine is receiving, it kind of tells you how much Russia must be spending. If we look at numbers from January 2022 to January 23, we can see that US military aid is the highest at $46.56 billion. The United Kingdom is way back in second at $5.13 billion, Poland comes in third at $2.5 billion, next countries are Germany at $2.47 billion, Canada at $1.35 billion, the Netherlands at $0.9 billion, Italy at $0.69 billion, France at $0.69 billion, Norway at $0.62 billion, and Denmark at $0.59 billion. But in a long list of nations giving military aid to Ukraine, some don't have very large GDPs. In terms of how much has been spent of a country's GDP, the US and UK rank 8th and 9th place. The first place country is Latvia, followed by Estonia and then Poland and Lithuania. 
Some Eastern European countries, of course, have a colorful history with Russia and its imperialistic ambitions. Making a donation to Ukraine is a no-brainer. Many companies have given aid to Ukraine too, such as Elon Musk's SpaceX, which has provided Ukraine with Starlink satellite equipment for internet use. Perhaps one of the strangest pieces of lethal aid, but also non-lethal, is the 500 packets of cigarettes provided by Philip Morris, the company behind the brand Marlboro. This isn't important in the greater scheme of things, we just want to give you an idea of the smaller costs of the war, so here are some more. The South Korean manufacturer of military gear has donated bulletproof vests, Amazon pledged $50 million in tech for logistics and cybersecurity, an American outdoors company gave Ukraine a million rounds of small caliber ammunition, some countries have donated helmets and knee guards, first aid kits, tourniquets, badges, sleeping bags, tents, generators, field rations, gas masks, and warm clothes. The list goes on and on, and includes lots and lots of fuel. Then there's the money that's been donated by citizens of various nations. The citizens of the Czech Republic somehow came up with $171 million for Ukraine. Poland and Lithuania citizens managed to raise many more millions, the citizens of Taiwan raised $33 million, and the citizens of South Korea $3 million. The list of countries expands significantly if we include all the humanitarian aid. Austria might not be donating any weapons to Ukraine, but it was nice enough to supply the country with 500,000 vaccine doses. Azerbaijan didn't send any weapons, but it evacuated vulnerable people from Ukraine and sent 29 tons of humanitarian aid to refugees. Croatia also gave money to refugees, and it helped out Ukrainian students. France supplied Ukraine with 21 new ambulances and 11 fire engines. Germany donated a mobile field hospital with 65 refrigerators and 1,200 hospital beds. It also gave 10 million euros in disaster relief. India donated $10 million in medical supplies and pills. Again, if Ukraine has these things, we can expect Russia also needs them. Hungary donated 500 liters of wine. Not just any wine, but wine to be used for communion. Ireland donated 500 tons of seed potatoes. Japan donated 83,000 solar-powered lanterns. Part of Slovenia's donations included 200 pairs of rubber boots and 250,000 latex gloves. The UK's package included $2.5 million to be spent on the training of judges and forensic experts. Why? Because of potential war crimes. The USA donated $1 billion worth of food, water, medicine, and other supplies. But maybe the most surprising aid in this whole terrible affair came from Vatican City. It donated a couple of cardinals that will give the Ukrainian populace material and spiritual support. Amen to that. The expression, everything but the kitchen sink, is entirely valid here. Even Lego, KFC, McDonald's, Google, Microsoft, Meta Platforms, aka Facebook, soccer teams, and game makers have gotten in on the act of donating. So, let's think about this. In one day in the war, besides using and losing weapons, you have the cost of helping refugees, you have a cardinal working possibly a 12-hour shift, you have computer technology working around the clock. At that same time, wounded soldiers are being treated in donated ambulances as donated fire trucks put out fires and doctors throw away countless pairs of donated latex gloves. Importantly, you have destroyed buildings and bombed roads that will all need reconstructing. With that in mind, figuring out the exact daily cost of war is like trying to assemble a 10 million piece jigsaw puzzle of the unobservable universe. But we will try our best to put this puzzle together for you. In February 2023, the Kiel Institute for the World Economy in Germany said aid from all nations added up to about $150 billion. Sounds like a ton of money, but consider the USA spends about $50 billion each year on another war, the war on drugs. The UK also spends about $7 billion a year on that same war, so if we count all the country's wars on drugs, the $150 billion for the war on Russia doesn't sound so crazy. It is a lot, but arguably affordable. From February 2022 to February 23, the USA was the biggest spender on Ukraine aid, with the figure for military, humanitarian, and financial aid being almost $72 billion. EU institutions spent $35.5 billion, the UK $9.8 billion, Germany $7.3 billion, Japan $6.2 billion, the Netherlands $3.9 billion, Canada $3.7 billion, and Poland at $3.5 billion. Interestingly, most countries' biggest expense was military, but Japan spent diddly squat on military aid and a ton of financial aid. This is why. The Kiev School of Economics said that in a 10-month period of the war in Ukraine, 149,300 residential buildings were damaged or destroyed, including 131,400 private houses, 17,500 apartment buildings, and 280 dormitories. It said this added up to about $54 billion in costs. 
That works out to 5.4 billion each month on average. Sure, no months are the same, but it's hard to be specific. As we make the video, we are in May, so let's add in the extra months. If we do, we get $81 billion. So if you do the math, it comes to $180 million a day for Ukraine regarding the loss of houses, apartments, etc. We also have to consider what Russia has been aiming at the entire war. Infrastructure. Ukraine's Ministry of Development of Communities, Territories and Infrastructure Development said that at the start of December 2022, Russia had destroyed or damaged 150 bridges or overpasses on state importance roads. The cost for that was put at $35.6 billion, but again, this was only until the beginning of December. There was a lot of damage done during the winter, but let's just take the average. Over 15 months, that'd be $53.4 billion, and that would work out to about $118 million daily on bridges and overpasses. So for bridges and buildings together, we get $298 million per day. Ukraine says as of December last year, 3,000 educational institutions were damaged or destroyed, including 1,400 secondary education schools, 865 preschools, and 505 institutes of higher education. The cost was $8.6 billion over 10 months. That works out to $12.9 billion over 15 months and $28.67 million per day. Let's round that one off and just say now we have a total of $327 million per day so far. The Kiev School of Economics said the list of things damaged or destroyed also included 907 cultural facilities, 168 sports facilities, 157 tourism facilities, and 95 religious facilities. Over 10 months, that added up to $2.2 billion. Over 15 months, that's $3.3 billion and $7 million a day. There are many more things we could list, but we'll start to speed things up now. So, there were many other costs over those 10 months, according to those hard-working researchers at the Kiev School of Economics. Some of the costs are as follows. Agriculture, $6.6 billion. Transport, $2.9 billion. Trade, $2.4 billion. Utilities, $2.3 billion. Culture, Sport and Tourism, $2.2 billion. Healthcare, $1.7 billion. Energy, $6.6 .6 billion. Electronics, $700 million. Social and Financial, $300 million. Ecology, a massive $14 billion. They said over a 10-month period, Ukraine had lost $137.8 billion in damages. This would make the cost over 15 months $206.7 billion, and for each and every day, $459.33 million. If we add that to Russia's estimated total of $405 billion, we get a total cost of about $612 billion for both countries, or $1.36 billion a day. But we didn't even count Ukraine's cost of fielding soldiers. Their basic pay is 20,000 hryvnias a month, or $550. But reports said frontline combatants would get 100,000 hryvnias bonus, $2,700 a month. Ukraine now has at its disposal about 1 million soldiers. However, nowhere near that are currently on the front lines. It's hard to work out the wages, but we do know Ukraine spent nine times more on its military in 2022 than in 2021. The total for 2022 was about $31 billion. Some websites reported that compensation paid to a dead soldier's family is 15 million hryvnias, which is over $400,000. If 50,000 Ukrainian soldiers die, that would be $20 billion in compensation. 50,000, unfortunately, is probably much less than will actually die. But it's also important to remember that 47% of Ukrainian companies stopped operating in 2022. Businesses closed down everywhere. The country pretty much lost its steel industry. It's thought Ukraine's GDP was down 30% on the year. This works out as Ukraine losing about $70 billion because of the war in terms of its GDP. It's estimated that 8 million refugees are now outside of Ukraine. A further 5 million are internally displaced. The World Health Organization reported that around 10 million people are at risk of having mental disorders such as PTSD, stress, anxiety, and depression, with the number of people abusing substances rising. The Ukrainian government said over 60% of its soldiers now suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, which will have both a negative economic and societal effect on the future of the nation. The WHO already puts Ukraine at the highest category globally for years of life lost due to alcohol abuse. And after this war, booze problems might get even worse. There's a lot of evidence saying trauma can lead to addiction and or alcoholism, as can a lack of purpose. With a wrecked economy, many families might feel this lack of purpose. This has to be counted on in the cost of the war. How much does this cost daily? We're not even going to put a price tag on that. We don't know how to. It's the same with human life. How can we put a price tag on that? 
We don't just mean the cost of a funeral, but the cost of an able-bodied person now not working to contribute to Ukraine's GDP. What about the emotional cost to their family, which will ripple into economic costs? The U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency said at the end of April 2023 that Russia had suffered 189,500 to 223,000 total casualties, including 35,500 to 43,000 men killed in action and a further 154,000 to 180,000 wounded. That same report said Ukraine had suffered 124,500 to 131,000 casualties including 15,500 to 17,500 men killed in action, and 109,000 to 113,500 wounded in action. But these estimates, according to a lot of analysts, are way off. The numbers could be much worse. So the human cost will have far-reaching ramifications in the future, more so in Ukraine. Ukrainians not even fighting in the war are feeling the pinch right now. In 2023, human rights groups reported a full-scale attack on the labor rights of all working people in Ukraine. This is wartime, so labor rights have been put to the side. This was made official when the government introduced a new law in March 2022 on the organization of labor relations during martial law. Media reports said that some of these new labor laws will last beyond the conflict. Harsh times, indeed. Ukrainians have already been hit with 27% price hikes and people are worried about super hyperinflation down the line. People talk about not having food or being able to heat their houses. An 80-year-old woman liberated in Kherson told the press in 2022, it is very depressing and we're nervous. We're living on old stocks, but now the light is turned off, the refrigerator doesn't work, and we have to throw the food away. How many excess deaths will this cause? It's estimated that in 2022, there were 150,000 excess deaths in Ukraine because of the war. This is damaging to the economy now and will further impact it in the future. Ukraine will be paying for this war for many years to come, decades even. The country will also be in debt. The Lend-Lease Agreement with the US doesn't mean Ukraine is receiving free money. The debt has to be paid back, but it can be over decades. The US won't force it. More likely, it'll be a situation where I rubbed your back, now you rub mine. Still, the agreement states any loan or lease of defense articles to the government of Ukraine under paragraph 1 shall be subject to all applicable laws concerning the return of and reimbursement and repayment for defense articles loaned or leased to foreign governments. The European Union handed Ukraine 18 billion euros in loans, and this too could cause trouble down the line. Printing money is not the answer. That often leads to catastrophe. Others have said Russia started the war, so the estimated $411 billion Ukraine will need to rebuild should be paid by Russia by confiscating its frozen $300 billion in central bank assets. That might sound fair on paper, but there are legal matters to think about, and if other countries start thinking their assets can just be taken away, it could cause turmoil on the global market. Countries might even lose faith in the dollar, and the US doesn't need any more nations losing faith in its reserve currency. Taking Russia's cash might lead to the US running into trouble, and anyway, harsh reparations need to be treated with care lest we see the rise of a tyrant in Russia far worse than Putin. Still, such a move does have some support. We should also add that some analysts say the reconstruction of Ukraine will cost more like $750 billion. A lot of lucrative contracts will be made inside and outside of Ukraine. It will boost the economy, but poorer classes will no doubt suffer during this time of reconstruction. UNICEF says rising inflation has sent 4 million children into poverty in Russia, Ukraine, and other countries nearby. The impact of more poverty is global, but inside of Ukraine it'll be felt profoundly. While Ukraine has taken steps to clean up all the corruption there, the country still lies in a lowly 116th place on the Global Corruption Index. Hopefully Ukraine can avoid hyperinflation and, hopefully, it can rebuild without too many corrupt officials sharing the spoils of reconstruction. Just considering these things, though, tells us what a tough time Ukraine faces. It'll need a lot of help, and the reconstruction will need to be monitored, lest the country's many corrupt business leaders take advantage. The daily cost of war, then, is quite astounding. Ukraine hasn't just lost good men on the battlefield and innocent civilians in the streets, it's lost a third of its economy, which will surely lead to instability down the line, including a negative effect on birth rates, mental health problems, crime, and corruption. Russia too will suffer, but it seems not as much. Then again, let's see what happens with possible reparations in the future. Reparations will help rebuild Ukraine. Also, will Ukraine receive help from those who have profited from the war? Ukraine might think it deserves that. We can't do a show on the costs of war without mentioning the profits of war. 
The world's 10 largest hedge funds made about $2 billion in betting on food commodities in 2022, but that was peanuts compared to Big Oil, BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Shell, and Total Energies, which made something like $134 billion in excess profits because of the war, and that was just in 2022. Norway's oil and gas sales will hit $131 billion in 2023, which is five times more than their revenue in 2021. Norway's financial support to Ukraine is $1.63 billion, a mere blip of its oil industry windfall. Far away from the battlefield and destroyed houses, it seems war is a fire to warm your outstretched hands. And the question is, which we're sure some of you are thinking, should some of these massive war profits go to helping Ukraine rebuild after the fighting is done? Ukraine's energy minister in 2023 said just that, big oil should help with the reconstruction costs. He said he and his team worked out that such companies have collectively had a war windfall of about $200 billion, which as you now know, would pay for a lot of reconstruction. He said, I think it would be fair to share this money with Ukraine, I mean to help us restore and rebuild the energy sector. But energy isn't the only sector dancing with the golden goose of death. Should other sectors be partially responsible for paying for Ukraine's reconstruction? For the arms makers and their many shareholders, it's been a terrific 15 months. For Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and Northrop Grumman, the situation in Ukraine has been a windfall. They and their shareholders reportedly saw skyrocketing profits of many extra billions in 2022. The Intercept wrote in May 2023 that U.S. arms sales added up to $138.2 billion in 2021 and a staggering $206.6 billion in 2022. But this included many nations, of course. The article stated, despite the White House's rhetoric about supporting global democracy, the U.S. sold weapons in 2022 to 57% of the world's authoritarian regimes. Direct military sales by U.S. companies alone increased 48.6% to $153.7 billion in 2022 from $103 billion in 2021, while sales conducted through the U.S. government increased 49.1% to $51.9 billion from $34.8 billion. But the UK, Swiss, and German arms industries also had a bumper year. CNBC said it would be a bonanza year ahead for all of the leading global arms industry, but not for Russian arms companies. Their collective exports have dropped to levels not seen since the fall of the Soviet Union. Destruction is obviously supremely lucrative, but the reconstruction will be another lottery win for giant corporations and companies outside of Ukraine. It's just a cold fact of the war, unfortunately. There's no getting around it. Reconstruction is an estimated trillion dollar opportunity for everyone who will be involved, so of course not everyone loses in this war. The hope is that post-reconstruction, Ukraine's people will finally enjoy a much better standard of living, and during reconstruction, Ukraine will get all the help it needs. Now you need to watch how the US would respond if Putin attacked first, or for something different, the craziest plane crash that turns survivors into cannibals.